Hey everyone, welcome back to part five of the full stack trading app tutorial. Today I'm going to be talking about historical price data. So we're going to start by reusing our Alpaca API key that we use to uh, get our list of tradable assets. We're going to reuse that API key with the Alpaca market data API. And we're going to talk about how to retrieve some historical data using that API. Um, not only that, uh, we're going to compare different uh, time frames. So some people have been asking about not just daily time frames, but their day traders who are interested in capturing uh, shorter, int shorter term intraday data. So they're interested in down to the minute uh, historical data or down to five minutes, 15 minutes, hourly time frame. They're not just interested in the open, high, low and close prices for the day. They want to know how the prices fluctuate uh, by the minute and capture that data. So we're going to talk about that as well. Um, in addition to getting data from the Alpaca Market Data API, uh, we're going to talk about some of the limitations to that data. After all, that data is free and comes with a free API key, so anyone can get access to it in a couple of minutes. But there are some limitations to that data that we'll talk about, and we'll talk about how to address that by comparing that against the Polygon IO data, which is a more uh, comprehensive uh, data set that we can uh, access using our Alpaca Live Broker account. So. I'll talk about that comparison in a bit and show you some of the limitations in the market data API and discuss them um, as we go. So uh, we're going to retrieve that data and we're going to store it in our stock price table that we've had ready to go. Um, not only that, um, as comments have come in, we're going to make a couple of refactors. So we're going to change our code a little bit, some of the code that we wrote in the first tutorials. And we're also going to change our database structure a little bit based on um, the data um, that we got from the uh, market data API. So I'm going to talk a little about how to evolve your not only your application code, but also your database code, because uh, you're never going to have your entire app written in, adv in advance the first time. So we need to continue to discuss you know, how to change, evolve our database schema and how to evolve our uh, code base to adapt and be very flexible. So uh, we're gonna, going to do a little bit of refactoring uh, and then, yeah, we're gonna, get, we're gonna get all of this data and store it. And then in the follow-up video in part six, uh, we're going to start building a UI here. So I kind of started doing that. Uh, we might make it a little more sophisticated than this, but we're gonna start simple. Um, per request of, I believe it was Sniper and James um, have requested Fast API, and I do think that's a good fit. So I've used Flask in the past few tutorials, but I also have a series on Fast API on the channel that you may have seen. And so we're going to use Fast API for this uh, tutorial um, and incorporate that here and revisit that because there's some uh, questions on the Fast API tutorial about uh, deployment and some other things. So we can cover, you know, kill two bir birds with one stone by uh, following up on the Fast API series, but also using that here. And also it's just as easy as using Flask. So uh, let's let's do that. So in the video I post after this, we'll uh, build, start building this web UI. So you see I have it running on my local desktop and this is gonna be browsing the uh, stock database, right? And then I can view the detail. So if I go to like Apple, for instance, I can click view and then I can browse the price history in a nice table for Apple stock. And this is just a table of daily price data, um, but we're gonna add more and more bells and whistles to this over time. We need to first set up the skeleton structure. We're going to, going to use a, a UI library and we're going to, um, yeah, just, just get started building the basic routes and the framework for our application. And then once we have that in place, we can continue to build on and add new uh, widgets and components to it and make it more sophisticated. So let's populate our price data and we'll also um, build in the second video that I post on today, uh, we'll start building this web UI. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started with that. But um, first, usual thing, um, I am posting this as a tutorial here, hackingthemarkets.com. I'm going to post a written version of this that I have written, and I'm gonna use this as the notes for this uh, video recording so you can follow along and we can make corrections as we go. So this is nice because in addition, uh, in the past I've just done the video recordings, but this is nice because you can do little 
copy and paste as you go and I try to build it up um, from the ground up. So it should make it easy to follow in pieces and get the source code afterwards. And obviously, uh, eventually I'll post full source code on GitHub for people that didn't follow, uh, follow along. But I do recommend following along because you're gonna get the benefit of building this application up over time and know how to evolve your application when you run into trouble uh, when building your own uh, creation. So, um, Website, yes, and thanks to anyone that donated. There's the donate link on Hacking the Markets right here, and I will thank, um, scroll down. Um, yeah, so since the last time, PM, thank you very much for the contribution. Um, thank you. And then David, who set a record, he bought 20 drinks, so I really, really appreciate that. He says he really looks forward to the series, so I definitely uh, need to deliver on that. So thank you for 20 drinks, the most generous uh, contribution ever. I really appreciate that, and it's very motivating uh, to help me keep going here. Um, thank you to uh, Firecoat, and he uh, is interested in the Teachable course, so as I mentioned, um, I'm starting to outline the contents of a course here that I'm going to use the Teachable platform for. And basically, it will be kind of like the channel is, but I would say like this full stack tutorial times five or ten maybe. So something much more thorough and comprehensive. And this is pretty thorough actually, but um, there's there's still so much. Uh, this is such a huge topic and there's so much to, to uh, cover that uh, to create a full course on this where you start at the beginning of Python, databases, um, all the different indicators we discussed, um, different strategies, uh, deployment. There, there's a lot of topics to discuss that can always uh, be discussed in more detail. And so I'm gonna try to capture all of that into a very uh, long form course. He says, keep it slow. I found, uh, I didn't know I was going too fast, but uh, a lot of people have said I've gone too slow. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's always hard to get the right balance because there's a variety of people uh, watching the channel, and that's the hardest thing with teaching, right? Um, some people uh, think things are fast. Some think, people think I'm going way too slow, and I drag things out. So there, there's a there's a balance there, and you can never get it perfect for everyone. Um, and yeah, and some people already know databases or Python or web development and have different stre uh, strengths, and some people come with no programming background. So yeah, it's hard to get it at the right level. So I try to start uh, fairly simple and build it up and then people can skip ahead if they want to, but we don't wanna uh, leave people out. So I try to make it digestible. Um, thank, thank you to Firecode. Uh, so thank you to uh, Christian. Um, and he asked if I'm gonna go over getting and storing intraday data. And yes, when we talk about Polygon IO in this very video, I'm going to look at the intraday data and compare it to what you get out of the box with Alpaca. And you can store that if you want to. I'm gonna store um, daily historical data at first for simplicity. So I'm probably not gonna capture the minute by minute data for every single stock in the stock table because there's like 9,000 stocks. And I believe Polygon only lets you fetch a one symbol at a time. So that actually takes a long time to capture all that data. What we'll probably do is flag uh, individual stocks uh, based on our daily prices to uh, select a small sample of stocks that we're interested in trading for a given day. And then when it comes to that day and we want to watch a particular stock more closely, we'll retrieve the intraday data or watch the intraday data and then make trades based on that. Uh, so um, yes, we will talk about intraday data. I'm not sure if I'm gonna store it in this video though. Um, and then thank you to Arvin. He said the videos are easy to follow and he's interested in Python for Finance, so he's in the right place. So uh, thanks a lot to everyone who contributed. Thank you to Christian, Arvin, uh, Firecode, David, and PM. And yeah, if you want to contribute to the channel, there's a donate link. And let's go ahead and get started with the tutorial. All right, so where did we leave off last time? So we created this createdb.py. It created our tables, our stock table, and our stock price table. These are stored in SQLite, which lives in a file called app.db. And we also created this populate db.py, which connects to that database. And then we used a cursor object to select um, all of the currently existing stocks in that table. There's none at the beginning, but once we populate it, we want to select all of them. That, that way we can see which stocks are already in our database. Then we configured a scheduled task or a cron job to get all of the symbols. Uh, we hit the Alpaca API. So we configured the Alpaca trade API, the uh, REST client. We passed it some keys and a base URL. 
we got a list of all of the tradable assets, and then we just wrote insert statements. So we used our cursor object to insert, insert these records into our stock table, and then we populated it. And so now we have this database table with stocks. So where do we go from there? So the first thing I wanna do is refactor a couple of things. You'll notice that uh, we have this API key in here, right? Which you don't really want to distribute that around. Since it's a paper trading account right now, that's not that big of a deal, but uh, this is gonna be need to be uh, secure, right? You're, when, once you switch to live trading, you don't want to uh, distribute your API key around, and it's good to not, for me in this video, not to show it on the screen, right? And so what we wanna do first is create a config file. And there's some good reasons for that as well. Uh, for code reuse, right? Because in the next script I write, I'm going to create a script called populateprices.py. And then this script, I'm gonna use Alpaca API again, in which case I would have to repeat this code and repeat this API key. And then if that API key changes or I generate a new one, which I'm about to do. So let me generate a new one. And there you go, I have, should get a new one. Yeah, so I have a new API key. So what if I have five scripts using that? I don't wanna go ha go back and change them all, right? So I create this config.py file here, and I'm just gonna say API key equals, like that, with quotes, and I will copy this one in here, which you will see, but I will generate even another one after this. So a uh, secret key equals that, and then in my populate db.py, I can add comma config and import that config. And instead of just hard coding this in here, I can do config.api key and then config.secret key. And then we'll even store this URL here. So I'll call this config.base URL. And then in my config, I'll set a base URL equal to that, right? and that'll be good to go. And then when I'm ready, if I have all my scripts using this info and I create a new API key and switch to live trading, I can either just erase that or I can create new uh, config variables for live trading versus paper trading. So that's all in one place and that's nice. And so my populate DB doesn't have any references to, uh, to those things, so uh, good. And then the other thing I could put in here that I already noticed, right, when I connect to the SQLite database uh, for the cron job, I type the full path here. Uh, but for create DB, um, I just typed the relative path. And since I'm going to have to connect to the database again, it'd be nice to just store the database path in the config file as well. So I'll just take this absolute path here, and we'll just call this a DB path. So we'll see, or DB file. So let's just call this DB file equals that. And then I have a path to my database. And then in my populate uh, DB, I can do, uh, where's my SQLite connect? I can do uh, config, config.db file. And then I'll just connect there. And then my create DB, I can still use the same one. So I can import config there. And I can use config.db file. And so all of our configuration and constants like that are in one separate file and we don't we don't have to duplicate this effort which is great because we're about to start populate prices.py and instead of populate db.py i'm going to rename this to populate uh, stocks.py okay and so we can create the database we'll populate the stocks and populate the prices so i'm separating those out so populate db.py was a little too uh, general of a name and so the first thing in the tutorial describes the config file and what to do there. And since I added a DB file here, path to your database file. Okay, so I'll add that there. That way this is up to date because I just thought of that. Okay, and then the next thing we want to discuss is getting our daily price data. And to do that, we're going to use the Alpaca Trade API again, and we're gonna use the Market Data API. So if you look at I'll park Alpaca Market Data API, right? Um, you'll get to this Market Data documentation that I have linked uh, here. Uh, so at the top of this tutorial, I linked the Alpaca Market Data and specifically the bars endpoint. So if I click on that, uh, this is the API documentation for getting a list of bars. You see there's a URL route in the API. 
and you can pass it multiple time frames. So one of the path parameters is what time frame you want. So you can do minute, five minute, 15 minute, or the daily. It doesn't look like there's hourly and four hours and things like that. There's other APIs that support all kinds of time frames. So there's a limited number of time frames supported here, and then you can pass it a list of symbols you want the historical data for. So at most 200 at a time. So I can fetch uh, the minute data for Apple stock by just passing one symbol, but if I just have, want all the FANG stocks, I can pass it Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and then say I want the five minute time frame, right? And so those are parameters. We're not using the URL directly here, the URL path directly here. We're using the Alpaca Trade API, uh, the Python library. So it's really just a function call where we pass in some parameters. So let's do that first. And so in here, I have some code here, and let's start very simple. Um, I could type it in, I'll just paste it uh, to save time. So we import our config that we have here. We're importing Alpaca Trade API as Trade API. And then just like in the uh, populate uh, stocks script, uh, we're initializing a REST client and we have our config now so we don't have to retype our API key. Uh, so our API is good to go. And then we call API.getBarset. And so if you look at the Alpaca Trade API Python, this, that's how I know about these methods or these functions to use. So we can talk uh, bar sets, right? So there's a function, if you look in their GitHub, get bar set set, and you need to pass it a list of symbols and a time frame, And then you can also pass it a start and end date, and those are optional. Otherwise it'll get as much as it has. And so by default here, let's say I want a list. So our list of symbols will be Apple and Microsoft. So we're gonna start simple, see how this works, let's see what the data looks like. So I want Apple and Microsoft, and I want it on the daily time frame, and then I'm gonna print what it returns. So I'm gonna run that, and it says config has no attribute API URL. So what's wrong? So I called it base URL. So I will call it API URL. API URL. I like I like the name API URL. So that sounds good. Um, populate stocks, and I'll call that API URL as well. So that should fix that issue. And now I'll run it again. And then now you see we got some data, right? And so you see in this list of data, there's this capital B bar. So these are these bar objects. So there's a list of bar objects. Uh, return for each stock symbol, um, and it has that's the closing price. So this is, looks like it's Microsoft since Microsoft is around 215. So the close uh, for this particular timestamp here was 214.41, uh, and then we have the high, the low, the open, uh, and the close of that day, along with some volume information. So um, that's all in here. And then where is Apple? So if you scroll up, um, you'll notice eventually that these prices will change. Uh, let's see if I can get there. Okay, probably around here. Um, yeah, somewhere in here you'll see the keys just for Apple stock. And I can't find it at the moment. Okay, so you see there's like a $500 price there and so forth. So if you see at the beginning here, um, yeah, see there's a key. So this is actually a dictionary. So that curly brace, it's a dictionary and one of the keys is Apple, and one of the keys is Microsoft. And then each key has a list of bar objects. So now we know the structure of that data, okay? So how do we, how do we iterate over that data? Well, so I, I pasted an example of what the data structure looks like. So what we wanna do is iterate over each of the dictionary keys, Apple, then Microsoft, and then for each of those, in the, each of those loop iterations, we'll loop over the list of bar objects. And so if you copy what I have right here, uh, just take this loop and put it here. And so what we'll do is in our populate prices, instead of just printing the bar sets like that, uh, we can do four symbol in bar sets. So that will do uh, for each of these symbols for AAPL and Microsoft in the bar set, which is this entire dictionary. So we'll process each symbol and then the bar, the bar set has a key for symbol, and so we'll loop through each bar in the list um, that that dictionary key points to, and then we'll print each of these attributes. So it'll bar.t, bar.o, hl, and so we'll access each of these bar object attributes and print them out. So if I run it like that, 
uh, you'll see that it will print out in this format. I'll do that again. So I run it, and then you see now we have it nicely laid out. We have the timestamp, and so you, since this is, the, this is the daily time frame, you'll see uh, you know October fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, right? And it's at midnight, and this it's minus four. Uh, that's a time zone offset, and so um, a lot of there's it when timestamps are stored they're stored as you know either utc time which is like a common time we can all reference and then a, an offset determines you know what time zone you're in and so negative four here minus four um, from that time is new york time minus seven i'm on the west coast so pacific time so it would be minus seven so this is basically just storing whatever it was at midnight which is basically you know it's just the end of the day in this case um and so you have your open, high, low, closed data and volume printed like this. And these rows are a little bit easier to read. So I said processing symbol Microsoft. When I got to that key, then printed all the bars in order. And then at the top, you'll see processing symbol Apple. And so that's how you iterate over the data and get it into a you know usable form like that. And so as you may guess, same way we got a response from the Alpaca market or the Alpaca API to get tradable assets, we iterated over each a stock and we generated SQL insert statements to insert those and populate our database. We're going to loop over all of these and insert them into our uh, price table, right? But before we do that, uh, let's talk about other time frames. So this is the daily time frame. So we have the daily uh, price action here summarized. But what if we want to go deeper and get uh, the minute by minute time frame, right? And so what you can do is one of the parameters is one minute. So I have a section here where I talk about uh, intraday price data. And so I'm gonna change stocks real quick to Zillow and use the minute time frame. So I'm gonna do Zillow and then do the minute time frame here. And let's look at what that looks like. So if I do that and run it, you'll see we have some minute by minute data. And so if I scroll back to uh, the 22nd here, right? Um, let's let's look through this. Let's see, let's see if we notice anything interesting. So if I scroll through, you'll notice uh, the 23rd on that historical on that historical data. Um, there's a missing minute. It goes 9:41, 9:42, then 9:44. So what happened there? And then notice right here, 9:45 to 9:48. There's a couple minutes missing there minute missing there. And so you'll notice these little gaps in this intraday data. So I talk about this briefly in uh, the article here of what's going on. And so you'll see these little gaps in the minute data uh, from the Alpaca market data API. And that's because um, this data set, it's just a free data set that anyone that signs up for a free API key doesn't pay any money, doesn't open a brokerage account or anything. They don't provide some, uh, this data can be costly. And so they don't provide like the entire snapshot of every single trade that happened on the entire stock market across all exchanges in this data set. So you'll see um, this is just a sample of certain exchanges. And so they list the exchanges that they have data for. Um, but if you want to get a complete uh, snapshot or historical up to the minute data for um, every single exchange in the entire market and every trade, then usually you have to pay money for that. Or in this case, um, Alpaca, if you have a live brokerage account, so um, I have a brokerage account and deposited some money in Alpaca, and that gives your API key additional powers, which is integrated, which is integration with Polygon IO. And so Polygon IO, actually has uh, snapshots of um, all exchanges. So if you look here and view pricing here, um, there's free for individual use. Um, they have historical data up to the minute uh, granularity and they have paid plans. So I haven't paid paid for any of this extra stuff here, but uh, if you get an Alpaca brokerage account, uh, you will get uh, minute by minute data. And then if you look here at some of the uh, benefits, right? Um, so if you look at the docs and resources, uh, REST API docs, you'll see they have a full, uh, fully documented API. And then you'll also notice when you click uh, stocks here, uh, you'll see they have all of the different exchanges. So 100% market coverage, market data across nine, 19 exchanges, 
don't sell for one or two exchanges for your data. Data, you want 100% market coverage. So if you want the best possible data, there's a, a bunch of different data feeds and we'll probably cover more of these on the channel. But I just wanted to mention that because a lot of people are surprised. If you look on the forums, a lot of people are surprised that certain bars, you know, if they're looking at minute data, they don't just get all of this uh, for free. So let's talk about how to use the Polygon integration uh, with Alpaca. So I have this section just on Alpaca. And if you don't want the intraday data or you're not interested in that, you skip ahead because I'm just gonna store the daily data for now. I want everyone to uh, follow along even if they don't have a brokerage account yet, but I do wanna mention this and look at it. And so I have this snippet of code here. You still configure the, uh, uh, the REST API the same way. You pass it your config secret key and uh, Alpaca has built this integration into uh, their uh, trade library here. So it's api.polygon and if you want, so um, yeah, if you want to use the Polygon integration, you do api.polygon and then you get these other functions you can use to hit uh, Polygon directly. And since I have this, I will copy it and let's just see what uh, these bars look like. So I'm going to take these um, hourly bars, right? So instead, I'm going to comment this out for a second and let's compare it. Um, so I'll comment these out. And so we can get the hourly bars, the five minute or a minute bars. I'll take the minute bars here and let's just call a different method. So in instead of API get bar set, comment that out and we'll say minute bars equals API dot polygon dot historical aggregate V2. And uh, the documentation in Alpaca will talk about this. So polygon. So if you look at the polygon section, there's information about the polygon web sockets, but also there's information about um, using the integration, just the REST API that gets Polygon data and the full API documentation, if you want to understand it better for Polygon is here. And so there's there's a lot more stuff. There's like uh, APIs for uh, news, there's dividend information, um, a, lo a lot of other stuff, Forex, uh, Forex data, crypto data, and things like that. So you get access to additional data, okay? So um, I'm gonna call this minute bars here and let's loop over it as well. So I'm accessing the minute bar. So I'll say for bar in minute bars, and let's make note of some gaps that were in here. So if we look on, what is it, the 23rd, we noticed like right here, the 23rd from 948 to 952, there's a couple missing, um, or 945 to 952. So let's see what that looks like on the uh, Polygon data feed. So we'll print bar dot, and their attributes are a little bit different. So I'm gonna print out just the whole bar at first. So 945 to 952, let's make note of that. Uh, my voice is cracking a little bit. Uh, so yeah, so you have timestamp and so they, they call it high, low, close, open. So um, we'll print bar dot timestamp, bar dot open, uh, bar dot close, high, bar dot open, open high, low, bar dot close. Okay, so let's print that and let's just look at that same uh, time period here and see how it looks. And so if we look, oh, and I did to the 22nd, uh, we'll get data through the 23rd. Okay. And then if I look here, let's scroll back to that same uh, time period, and you can see 942, 943, 944, 945, 6, 7. And so you see this data is uh, much more complete. Uh, we have uh, intraday price data that's a little more accurate, that or that's more accurate and uh, gets captures these minute bars where maybe not, where, where maybe no trades went through on the exchanges that Alpaca, uh, the sample of trades that Alpaca gets on the exchanges uh, that their market data aggregates. So uh, more detailed data here, but I believe you have to have a live brokerage account with Alpaca for this functionality to work or you'll get some kind of authorization error. So uh, if you want to, and you already have that brokerage account, you can feel free to play with this and store this data, but uh, just so everyone can follow along, uh, we're going to use this data set here uh, because we're going to start with uh, daily data anyway and make it more complex as we go. So I'm going to undo these changes and that source code is available um, on the blog post. Okay. So let me get that out of the way. Okay, cool. So we've discussed uh, daily and intraday data. 
And so what's next? So that's the five minute time frame. That's the hourly time frame. And I show uh, how that output looks on the blog. Uh, so the next thing we're gonna do is make a couple changes to the database. And I'm gonna go through this real quick. I don't wanna spend too much time on this. It's kind of dry. Uh, but um, what I wanna do is um, there was a commenter who mentioned uh, having trouble with, uh, then I actually left a typo in, and this is the data storyteller um, on this on the YouTube channel. Um, I had a typo here um, and she said, not that one. I think it's in the video here. Yeah, so uh, the data storyteller says, uh, table has stock has no column name name. And it looks like in the blog post, if you're following along there, um, I, I had called the column company and then changed it to name at some point, but I didn't actually change it um, in the video, but I'm interested in changing it now. So how do we alter um, our database? And, and thanks for that comment that I like when people point out. Uh, errors like that. Um, so we can do an alter table statement. So that's a SQL statement that lets us change our database structure, including uh, renaming column, columns or removing columns. But um, I'm going to go ahead and drop the entire table and recreate it as a second approach, uh, since we don't really have much valuable data anyway. And I also want to make sure we can rebuild this database from scratch. So it's useful to have a drop tables script. And so that's what I've done here. If you want to copy that, and I'm going to create a drop db.py script. And that way, if we need to just recreate our database from scratch, we'll have this available. And so we'll also import the config here and call it uh, config.db file. And so this script will just connect to the database and it'll drop both of those tables using our cursor object. We'll execute drop table statements and start over, right? And so I'll run this and boom, our database is wiped out just like that. There's no tables in there, which means, you know, luckily we have this create database script so we, we, we can recreate the database at any time. And the change I wanna make is instead of ID symbol company, since there's ETFs in our tradable assets, such as the uh, triple leveraged S&P 500 ETF, that's not really a company, it's just the name of some tradable instrument, right? And so I'm calling it name this time. So we'll recreate our database and call it name this time. And also that will solve that one error in the blog post. Um, and also, yeah, and so also it shows us how to evolve our database over time. The other thing you'll notice, we don't have this adjusted uh, close column in our data. So I'm gonna delete that as well. Um, so there's no adjusted volume or adjusted close. Our response just has date, open, high, low, close, and volume. And so I don't wanna have any required fields in our database table that we don't have in our data set. And so now I can do that. And now I can run this again, and then we'll create, create the database. Okay, so that should have run. And then now I can open, let's just open the SQLite browser real quick. And I'll do open database. And then we'll go to projects, full stack app, and open app DB, or you can use the command line. Um, and then if we look at our structure, uh, you'll see um, our table's up to date. It's called name, and there's no adjusted field in there. So that looks uh, good to go. Someone asked why stock ID is integer in some of the comments. And if you're following along, then you should have saw the part on foreign keys. So we have a reference. This stock ID and stock price references this ID, which is an integer. Someone asked why it's not a string. So I talked a lot about why it's not a string. So make sure you understand uh, the foreign key concept. And the reason why is that this symbol, even though it seems unique, isn't really truly uh, unique. You'll remember that stock symbols change over time. So uh, Exxon Mobil, you know, you say it Exxon, you know, the symbol used to be X-O-N, Exxon, uh, but when they acquired mobile, it became X-O-M, right? And so if we stored symbol here and here, then we'd have thousands of records with X-O-N still, right? And then it'd be X-O-N here. And then when we create more and more tables, like watch lists that reference particular stocks, if we stored X-O-N there, and user watch lists and notifications, and we reference that, then we don't wanna update that all over the place. We want a unique number. So whenever a stock symbol changes, um, then uh, we only change it in this stock table, and then everything else references this number, which is guaranteed to be unique. And then the other reason is um, stock symbols, sometimes 
uh, stocks get delisted and then the stock symbol becomes available again to another stock. So a symbol of Visa, V, which is a huge stock now, uh, V wasn't always Visa. Uh, I believe it was Vivendi. Um, Vivendi, which was, I believe, a media company. Do they own MTV? Um, yeah, Vivendi, right? And this is some conglomerate, right, that owned a bunch of other companies. So that ticker symbol V used to be Vivendi, and then it got reassigned later. So stock symbols change. Um, our database can stay the same with using this structure. And also, if we delete a stock from the table, we can even set up rules to cascade and automatically have a relational database delete all references to that site and clean it up. Or if we have a user you know, that worked for our company and we want to delete that user, we don't want all their records around, we can delete their user record. And then in a relational database, that can cascade down and delete any passwords, permissions, access they have. And so this foreign key relationship, that's why that's uh, super important. It's important for uh, database consistency, re eliminating redundancy, and, um, and you know, just managing our data and making sure um, all of it is cleaned up appropriately. So that, that's a quick note on that. So uh, database is up to date now. And so now all we have to do um, is let's go ahead and populate our stock table. So we have this part written already. Um, so let me go ahead. I'm gonna, I have a code snippet here that I'll walk you through. We've already written most of the, this code. Um, so that's the populate stocks table. Actually, we are going, going to repaste this. Um, we renamed this to populate stocks, right? And I'm going to rerun this, right? Cause we just dropped our table and recreate it. So we're gonna run populate stocks and recreate all of our stock records. And I'm gonna refactor and put in the config.db file here. And then we're selecting from stock. Uh, nothing's gonna be in there yet. And then we're gonna run through and insert all of the assets. Uh, and one thing to note, and I'm gonna let an error happen most likely. So if, oh, I'm in this web directory. That's why it's not auto-completing. Python 3 uh, populate stocks.py. If I run that, um, you'll notice, so there's an error there. Um, why did that happen? And why is my URL like that PAPI alpaca market? So there's a connection error. Um, yeah, and it looks like maybe I was, when I was typing around, I must have somehow changed this. Let's see, did I mess up? Uh, redo, I must have done this earlier and not even noticed. Okay, so as I was typing around, uh, so it's paper API dot, I messed up the URL. Good news is I only have to change it in that one place and it's called API URL. And if I run that uh, populate stocks again, let's see if it'll run this time. All right, table stock has no name, com no column name company. And so we need to make a change to this, right? So we renamed it to name. Okay, so I'll run it now. And let's see what happens. Added a new stock. Good, so we added a bunch of stocks. And then um, we don't, let's see, let's browse data. I've already opened the database in here and you see our stocks are present and it's symbol and name, which is good. So we've repopulated um, our database. One thing you'll also notice if you have this table open uh, and you close uh, SQLite, if you use this UI browser, it'll ask you to uh, save the data. So if you make some updates here, then it doesn't save unless you explicitly say save, otherwise it'll throw away your changes. And also if you run into some kind of database locking error, that'll mean, be, that'll mean that this, if you're using this UI application, you try to change the structure of your database, sometimes you'll see it say uh, the database is locked. So you'll wanna close this, anything that has, that is writing to that database. Um, so yeah, be careful if you're running a script that alters the database and have the database already open at the same time. So just something to look out for. Okay, so that's good to go. Uh, I'm gonna close that out. Um, so populate stocks. So now we know how to rebuild our database from scratch and we have these scripts uh, that can do it, right? So now let's go ahead and populate our stock prices. And so I am going to copy one more script and walk through it. And this will be our final populate prices script and we'll be done. Okay, so I'm gonna copy this and let me talk about what this does. And again, I'm going to use our database file refactor there. 
Okay, so we import SQLite to connect to our database. We import our config because that has our constants for our API URL. And we're importing trade API, right? We connect to our database and we create our cursor object. We specify we want um, objects, SQLite three objects returned from our query rather than uh, a tuple because it's easier to work with. We can use um, attributes that are named. Uh, we check the stocks. We get a list of all of the stocks that are in our uh, table and we're gonna fetch them, right? And then for each one of those stocks, we're going to want to uh, fetch price data. So we'll, we'll want to call the Alpaca market data API for each one of those stocks and fetch the price data and store it. And so one, I, one thing I've done here is iterate it over it slightly differently. So let me talk about this part real quick. All right, I'm going to comment this out and comment that out. And then I'm gonna put it just like it was before. So a row, we're gonna break this down a little bit more and, and type it up to explain what I'm doing. So row symbol uh, for row and rows. And this is a list comprehension for row and rows. Okay. So I'll print the symbols out and let's run this. Okay, so that's our list of symbols in our database in the present, okay? So I'll leave that commented out for now and then talk about why I did this later. Okay, so API equals trade rest. We configure our API and then I'm gonna skip over this chunking first. So you'll remember, um, actually I I'll talk about the symbol chunking here. So. Remember we said that the Alpaca Market Data API lets you request price data of up to 200 symbols at a time, right? But how do we get, uh, we have 9,000 stocks, so how are we gonna loop through them? We could loop through them one by one, but uh, that is not very efficient. We'd make thousands of API requests. So what we wanna do is loop through it 200 at a time. So to do that, I've created this a chunk size here and so we're saying we wanna loop through in chunks of size 200. And so what we're gonna do is loop over um, a certain number of records at a time. So this for I and range from, so we're looping over a range of zero. If symbols is 9,000, we're looping from zero to 9,000. But the third parameter, if you've never done this in this range uh, function is a step size, right? And so this would be 200. And so this would be um, zero to 200. And then we'd loop through 201 uh, to 400 and so forth. So it's like we're paginating, right? And so we're gonna get a chunk of symbols. So we have our entire symbol list and we'll go from zero to the chunk size. So it'd be like zero to 200 right and then the next iteration of the loop it would be like uh, 201 to 400 so let's let's comment this out real quick just to see um, what that looks like so i'm going to print what i looks like so print i and then print i plus chunk size right and then let's run this and so you see how we get um, these indexes right 4,000 to 4,200, 4,200 to 4,400, and so forth. And range excludes the last number, so um, that's why there's this duplicate here. So this will be 4,200 to 4,399, and then the next iteration loop will start at 4,400. And so you see how we get a chunk at a time. And so if we look at our symbol chunk, where we access you know, from 4,200 to 4,399, um, if we print a symbol chunk, uh, you'll see how, see how that's nicely divided into chunks of 200. So that's how you iterate over a loop, a chunk of data at a time. And then when we call the bar set uh, function that we mentioned earlier, that we used earlier, we just passed it Apple and Microsoft, but now we're gonna pass it a list of 200 symbols in each chunk and capture a chunk at a time, okay? So that's what this chunk size is. And then once we do that, we get a bar set. So we'll loop through each symbol in this bar set like we did before. We'll process the symbol, and then we'll loop through each bar in the bar set for that symbol. And then we're gonna insert, do an insert statement for each one of those uh, stock bars, right? So we'll insert in stock price, date, open, high, low, close, and volume. And we have the stock ID here, right? And that's the last tricky part, right? So we're gonna list out, we're gonna put these named uh, parameters here. We're gonna put these question marks for uh, the parameters, for the values. 
and then you do this comma and then you pass it a tuple of the values to insert into these placeholders. So we're gonna insert into stock ID, whatever's in stock ID in this variable is gonna go here, date, it's gonna go here, right? And so all of our data is gonna get inserted and we're gonna run this statement over and over again, right? Um, so stock ID, what is that? We mentioned it's not a stem symbol, right? It's a foreign key reference. Um, so how do we get the number associated um, with the stock, right? We need whatever the primary key of the ID is. And up here, we're already, we already selected um, the ID of the stock, right? So we know it here. So let's go ahead and store that. And that's what this loop is for. So this stock dictionary. So we're gonna have a dictionary lookup where the key is the symbol. So we're gonna have for symbol Apple. So the stock dictionary in Apple, right, would have like the number, the value would be the number of the ID. So it'd be number one, two, three or whatever, right? And so we'll have a lookup table so that we can pass in a symbol to the stock dictionary. Uh, we can access that key and see what its uh, stock ID is, right? And so this is just looping over the rows up here and we're gonna get a list of symbols, but we're also gonna store this stock dictionary so that we can look up a symbol and get its stock ID easily. And that, and right here you'll see we do stock ID equals stock dictionary. And as we're on a symbol, we're gonna look that up and then get the stock ID and use it here. And, that, and that's how we get the reference to the stock ID in the other table. The other way to do that is um, there's actually something, uh, a subquery, and you can actually do select, you can do a select in line here, but I'm not gonna do this. So you can select ID from stock where, and then have uh, the database query uh, get that ID for you. But I'm not gonna do that. Just for simplicity, um, we're going to just store the ID and then look it up. So that's that. Um, yeah, let's see if this runs. So I'm gonna run this and try to get price data. Let's see if it goes. Populate prices.py, processing symbol. And so you can see 200, 200 more, 200 more, right? You see how there's a slight pause between each API call, but there would be a larger pause if we did 9,000 API requests and make a network request, then a pause, network request pause. And since we don't wanna wait for all that, that's this chunking uh, strategy, it works out really well. So doing 200 at a time, we minimize the number of API calls and do what, like uh, 40, 50? Uh, 50 times 200, yeah. So we might do like 40 or 50 calls instead of uh, thousands of calls. So that saves a lot of time there. So uh, that's great. And it saves load on Alpaca's API. And and uh, if we're running a snapshotting function every uh, five minutes or every minute or so, right, we might not have time to make thousands of API requests. So we have to think about efficiency, things like this. And so that's why we're doing uh, the chunk size. So I'm going to go ahead and let this run all the way through. All right, so it looks like that just finished. So let's go ahead and verify our data. So we'll open up our SQLite browser where you can use the command line. I'm going to open up the database, okay? And so I'll go back to my projects, okay. Full stack app, and I'm going to open the database up and then we can go to browse data and I'll select the stock price data now. And you see we have the stock price table and then we have this giant list of, looks like we have 1.6 million rows now. So does that sound about right? Uh, yeah, so we have 8,000 or 9,000 stocks or so. So if I look at the stock table, uh, nearly 9,000 stocks here. And then our stock price table has 1.6 million. Uh, and let's go ahead and look at the stock price history for a single stock, just to make sure it makes sense. And so what I'll do is go to execute SQL. So you'll notice like, well, yeah, it's since a stock ID is a number, how do we know what stock that is? So what we can do is a database join. If you know SQL, you've probably done this before. And so I can write a join query and I put it here for you. And so what we can do is instead of our normal SQL select, right, we can select date, open, high, low, and close from our stock price table. But if we wanna select from two tables at once, uh, we can join those tables together. So I'm gonna select the symbol as well. So I'm gonna select these columns from the stock price table, but I'm gonna say join the stock table on stock.id equals stock price dot stock ID. And uh, we'll talk about this more um, in the future, but I just wanna introduce the concept of joins here. So we're joining two tables together. We're joining the foreign key relationship here so that uh, we're, we're letting SQL know that we want to uh, combine these two tables and we're selecting the symbol is actually coming from the stock table. 
um, and then we're joining the stock and stock price to, uh, table together. Um, and then we're gonna say where symbol equals Apple and order by date. And so if I hit this play button, we should get some data back. And it looks like I actually ran this script twice a little bit ago. And so that's why uh, there's two uh, copies here, but uh, I'm gonna clear that out and rerun this script again. Um, I won't do it now, but just know there should only be one if you've run it one time. Um, if there's multiples, then that means you probably ran the script twice. So we have no checks that there aren't duplicate records in here. Uh, so I'll let that mistake go for now and I'll repopulate this. Uh, before our UI lesson in the next video. And so you see for each date, the June 4th, uh, 5th, uh, it skips weekends since there's no price data, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, we have open, high, low, and close data, and that looks great, and that goes all the way up till um, the present day. So um, today is Saturday, that goes up through uh, Friday. So that is great, and it looks like uh, we have data going back to June. There's some more parameters that we can pass to capture additional historical historical data uh, going back, but this doesn't give you like the entire, same way we only pass 200 symbols at a time, uh, there's probably, probably parameters you have to pass to get data that's further and further back. And so we'll dive more into that stuff later. So this is good for now. We have months of daily data. We'll go more into intraday uh, data intraday uh, data later, and also uh, further back historical data for backtesting purposes in some follow-ups. But I think that's pretty good for this video. I think it's been uh, pretty long. It feels like it's gone pretty long at this point, so this is probably a good cutoff point. So yeah, we've we've covered a lot. We covered uh, what we've done so far. We covered some refactoring, including you know creating a config file, renaming some files, renaming some database tables, and recreating it, and how to use the Alpaca Market Data API to retrieve some uh, daily historical data. And we also retrieved some minute data, some intraday data, and talked about some of the limitations to free data sources like the uh, Alpaca Market Data API that's uh, provided for free and some of the limitations there as far as the granularity, not getting the full price history or the full uh, snapshot of every trade that's ever happened and, and comparing that against what you get with Polygon IO and you know having a paid brokerage account and some of the differences there. Uh, but for our purposes, if you're just trading on the daily timeframe, you can make pr plenty of profits there just looking at uh, daily timeframes. A lot of people think that somehow if you look at finer and finer, more granular data up to the second and up to the minute that you can execute tons of trades and build some tradable, uh, some really profitable strategy that way. And I found that to not necessarily uh, be the case. I think um, a lot of my biggest profits have come from uh, trades that have lasted days, weeks, months, or even over a year. Uh, you reduce the number of trades that you make. I think a lot of times that uh, results in more profits personally, um, especially if you can hold something for a year and pay a uh, lower lower taxes on that. I think that's very um, advantageous, actually, um, you'll find. So uh, just because you execute thousands of trades in a day doesn't mean that, or and you use minute time frame data doesn't mean you're going to be more profitable with some algorithm because you're going to run into a lot of a lot of intraday noise, uh, quite frankly. So uh, but yeah, it's good to, good to be able to uh, access that data as well. And you may have great purposes uh, for using that data. So if you want that data, it is available. All right, uh, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next video that I'm gonna post uh, later today. And that is going to be on creating a web UI using Fast API. Uh, this, while it's been fun looking at the command line for this long and talking about databases, some of you might want to see something nice with buttons and widgets and and a nice user interface for browsing this in a user-friendly way without writing SQL. And that's what we're going to do next. So uh, thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next video.